Happy New Year. Um, yeah, don't download that app. No wonder it has one star. <laughs> All jokes out of the way. If you click this video, you're probably getting hit with some sort of objection on your sales call, whether that's, I need to think about it. That's too expensive. I need to talk to my spouse or my partner. I need to talk to my dog. I need whatever the objection is. I promise you we're going to go over it in this video and break down exactly how to get past it. If you go through this video and really take it all in, you will be on a much better path to 15, 20, 30, even $50,000 a month because you're going to know how to get past the objections that ultimately are holding your prospects back from moving forward with you on your sales calls. Now you might be saying, Aaron, that's a pretty hefty promise. Well, it's actually not me doing this training. It's gonna be the founder of the Remote Closing Academy. Heck, the guy that basically created remote closing in general is gonna be doing the training for you guys. And it's from our in-person event from about two weeks ago that we had over 150 remote closers come in person and just learn and grow and network and become honestly, just better salespeople. And keep in mind, guys, those people paid to be there and you're going to get a free sneak peek here on the YouTube channel. So this is going to be a training that you come back to over and over and over again in 2023. If you're someone that's looking to get into remote sales or better your remote closing career and make 20, 30, $50,000 a month. So with all that being said, enjoy the training. This one's going to be mastering the objections when they do happen, because no matter how good you are on the front end, they're still inevitably going to get some objections. We're going to talk about the different types and I titled this the psychological and tactical guide because we're gonna talk a lot about philosophy so you know the right way of thinking about handling objections, but also I'm gonna give you a lot of scripting and exactly what to say as well. So we're gonna talk about what are objections really, why do we get objections, the difference between logistics and objections, the fundamentals, and then the big three and how to handle getting on the scripting. So what are objections? So the definition I looked up when I Googled it was an expression or feeling of disapproval or opposition. Uh, you know, my simplified cold definition is any reason truthful or not, smokescreen or not, a prospect does not want to move forward after hearing the offer on a sales call. Now, why do we get objections? There's four reasons. And this is like kind of the philosophy part I want you guys to understand before I tell you exactly what to say, okay? Uh, the first one is logistics, okay? So this is a, a real reason to where they 100% want to do it. There's 100% intent, but there's some sort of logistic and it's a real issue that's keeping them from doing it right now. Okay, so like let's say all their money is in a brokerage account and it is a true three day transfer period before they can fully make the payment. Let's say that it's a spousal objection, but based on their net worth or their family, like, you know, realistically, that the person just can't make the decision right there. Like it makes sense. Maybe somebody's buying a home and they can't have a major transaction while they're buying a home. Maybe they're selling their business. Okay, like we had an objection in November and in an SDA, and it was literally because the guy was exiting his business and the private equity company didn't want him to spend that money in November. Like, you know, what, what are you gonna do about that? That's just a logistic at that point. So when you get really, really good, and this is how I am on my calls, when you get really good, about 80 to 90% of your objections are always just logistics, because you really don't get uh, the other types and uncertainty, which we're gonna cover. The next reason is a breakdown in the sales process. So. This kind of covers what you were saying about prevention, but there's seven beliefs the prospect needs to have to buy. There's pain, doubt, cost, desire, money, support, trust. So pain is that there's a gap or a problem. Doubt is the inability to fix the problem, okay? Cost is that there's gonna be consequences to not fixing the problem. Desire is the compelling payoff of fixing the problem. Money is the resources and willingness to fix the problem. Support is stakeholders in the decision or people around close to them gonna support them in fixing the problem and trust is trust in your method of fixing the problem, right? So you noticed the last six, I ended it of saying of the problem, right? That's because all those six, seven, six beliefs out of the seven are predicated on the first one, which is pain, right? That there has to be a problem. That's because in business, it's really about solving problems. When you solve a problem, you create value, people exchange money for value. So if we know that to be true, sales is really the demonstration we can solve a problem. Else. So the entire conversation needs to be about the problem or about the gap, right? Remember from last time, there's two problems. There's like a real pain, okay, like back pain, and then there's an unfulfilled desire. Unfulfilled desire could be you're healthy, you're 10% body fat, but you want to get down to 7% body fat because you want to compete in a competition, right? That's an unfulfilled desire, you know? And there's people who want to get out of their nine to five, but there's also people who are already making a million dollars a year and want to get to $10 million a year. Are they really in pain or is it more of an unfulfilled desire? So those are two types of gaps. Does that make sense? So we covered that last time. But um, with breakdowns in the sales process, what happens is, you know, the sales process I teach is designed to sort of almost like use these like a checklist 
Because each of these, if you don't cover that belief, if you don't instill that belief with your questions, it leads to an objection at the end. Does it make sense? So a breakdown in the sales process objection is an objection you get because we fail to tick one of those boxes. All right, so when you're new, this is the majority of objections you typically get, right? And, and what's really frustrating is, uh, like anybody who's done a group, uh, group like sales clinic, you know, or group sales training to where it's just Q&A and it's not call review, typically what happens is all the questions are like, hey, so like, what do I say at the end when they say this? Hey, they said this, you know, what are you supposed to do? Uh, they're ghosting me, like what text should I send? And so those are all addressing the symptom, not the root cause. And like, you guys know that, but oftentimes when you're just starting off or you're kind of in an intermediate stage, what happens is a lot of your uh, missed sales and a lot of your objections are because of this, not necessarily because you don't know exactly what to say at the end. Does that make sense? So as you get more advanced, you don't get as many of these and then you just get more logistics. The third reason is a conditioned buyer's response, right? So everybody's kind of going in uh, around their lives running a script, okay? Like when you're driving your car here, you're running a script. Like you're not consciously thinking about every little thing you're doing. Your brain's trying to conserve energy, right? Because our brains are optimized for survival. And so you're sort of like automatically doing it. It's subconscious. Well, a lot of times after a lot of experiences being sold, like if you guys sell real estate agents, they have a lot of conditioned buyer's response because they're so often sold, right? So here, you could still get an objection even if you ticked off the seven beliefs, but they're sort of stuck in a script of the way they make decisions. And so they just always might, like this is the typical, oh, I have a rule where I just never make a decision on the spot, or I always sleep on it, okay? So that's due to the resistance of prospects being sold over a lifetime, all right? And we'll talk about how to handle that. And sometimes you can let them you know, sleep on it and they're still gonna buy if you do the right things. And then there's unclosable, right? So there's, you know, there, there's certain situations where there's just no reason that they're ever going to close now. So, you know, if they love it, but I literally have $175 and I have a sub 500 credit score, you know, and the, and the program's 10K, there's just, you know, okay, sure, they could sell their car, they could get a loan, they could, you know, their, their mom could give them money or something, but generally I'm gonna call that unclosable. And it's important to realize that that's, you know, there's situations where some people just can't be closed. So what are the big three? So pretty much any objection you can get will be categorized into one of these three categories. I think this is the simplest way to think about it. I've seen five categories, seven categories. Like I think three is just the easiest. So the number one and the most important one to understand is uncertainty. So an uncertainty based objection is anything that keeps you from being less than 100% certain that this is the right thing and now is the right time. Okay, so I wanna think about it, due diligence, research, pray on it, sleep on it, meditate on it. It's too risky, can I get a guarantee? Can I speak to one of your clients? Can I do some research? I mean, all of that stuff, okay? It's anything that's keeping them from being less than 100% certain that this is the right thing, now is the right time, okay? So a big part of understanding uncertainty-based objections is also understanding that there's two sales to be made on every sales call. Does anybody know what it is? Yes, okay, so there's a sale on the method and a sale on the product. All right, so like the easiest way to explain this, I always explain it this way, is like Russell Brunson, and he, you know, this is where I got this from. But if you watch his sales presentations, he doesn't try to sell you on click funnels, he tries to sell you on funnels being the fastest, most effective, best way to be able to get customers online. Because by the nature of believing that domino belief, you're naturally going to buy the product as a buy product of that. Does that make sense? So an uncertainty-based objection is rooted in the fact that they're not totally 100% certain in the method and that that method is the best way to fix their problem right now. Because if you establish what their number one problem is, lead generation, let's say, and you've established that they believe your method is the best way to fix their lead generation, then you tick these both off. Because if their number one problem is lead gen, that means they should do it now. And if they believe your method is the best way to fix it, that means that this is the right thing. So it fits those two criteria, does that make sense? So I call this the, the thesis, all right? And so a lot of your sales call is just selling them on the thesis, which it's indirect, right? You're not selling them on the product. When you sell them on the product, it creates resistance. When you sell them on an idea, it's education. And so there's not as much resistance towards it. But you have to like pre-price drop, 
a lot of preventing objections is all about selling them on, this is the right thing, now is the right time. This method is the right thing to get the desire, and it's also exactly the number one problem you should be focusing on in your life right now. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to do this. This is just kind of the philosophy behind it. So uncertainty is very important. Uh, we'll cover that in the next slide. Financial is, you know, you guys know what that is. I don't have the money, I can't afford it, all that stuff, right? So there's three types of financial objections. There's smoke screens, which are fake objections. That's, that's when they say, oh, it's too much, or oh, I don't have the money, but it's really just uncertainty, okay? Then there's logistics. So they intend to do it. However, there's just real logistics, like again, Maybe it's the whole thing about uh, them buying a home or um, them, you know, they're, they're exiting their business right now or it's the three-day transfer thing. So there's actual logistics and then there's conditions. So that means they're unclosable, right? Like they have a 512 credit score with 150 bucks, like there's no way they can do it. So those are the three types. The main, type, the main thing we're gonna cover is how to, one, figure out if it's a smoke screen and then two, determine if it's logistics and conditions. So we work in that order. So the scripting I'm gonna give you is gonna help you do that exactly. The final one is support. So this is any reason they're deferring decision-making authority to anybody who's outside of the sales environment. Now, this again has three types. There's smoke screens, so the same thing. It's, it's, it's actually, you know, oh, I gotta talk to my spouse, but realistically, they just, you know, they're not sold. There's permission, which means they gotta get their, uh, spouse, business partner, whoever's permission to see if they can do this. And then there's courtesy. And I just made that one up, but courtesy is basically, I've already decided I'm going to do this. I just need to let them know how to courtesy. Because off, you know, in my objection handling framework, as you're gonna see, a lot of the language is like, are you just letting them, have you already decided to do this? You're just letting them know? Or do you need to like really sit down and get their permission so that you can do this? because you handle those two differently. One's probably gonna to lead to a deposit close. The other one may lead to a deposit close, but also you might have to follow up. So remember, I mean, this is spouse, business partner, like those are the, the main ones. But remember, this could also be like somebody's CFO or their you know, executive, or it could be an implementation team. Like there was one time I was gonna buy something, but I wasn't gonna implement the thing, okay? So I was like, you know what? I need to talk to the, the people who are gonna implement this to see what they think and to see if they're actually gonna do it before I buy it. Cause like I, I buy everything, you know, I'm easy. <laughs> All right, but I, you know, I didn't wanna buy it also, it was like 25K. I didn't wanna buy it and then like nobody implements it. And so I was like, all right. So I talked to them and they were like, ah, you know, we really shouldn't do it. It's like kind of a waste of money. Like they kind of talked me out of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, so that was a support objection. Now, maybe if I had brought them on the call, like the salesperson could have handled that. But um, in that case, they did not. So. How we handle every single objection. This shouldn't be like a, the, all these bullets should be in the same line. I should have fixed that. But what we do is we paste the first objection. So we do a pace pace lead. And then what we do is we tie down that this is the right thing, now's the right time. Basically any objection, no matter what, we pace pace lead, which is, is, you'll see what that is, but it's similar to like just agreeing with everything they said and diffusing the pressure. And then we always circle and loop back to Basically, hey, do you believe this is the right thing? Now is the right time. We don't say it explicitly like that, but that's how we, you know, that's the first thing we do. Now, once we get a double tie down that this is the right thing, now is the right time, then what we do is we isolate the objection, okay, the real objection. Then we can reframe and handle the objection and then ask for the sale or do a trade. I'll show you what a trade is later, okay? Now, very, very key points here. What we do, this is, this is like one of my biggest breakthroughs I ever have with objections. You always handle uncertainty first and then move on to support and financial. So the big thing I want you guys to know is that you can't, if somebody gives you a spouse objection, but they're also on like, cause you can get two, you can get all three of these or you get two out of the three. So if somebody gives you a spouse objection, but they're actually not hundred percent certain that this is the right thing. Now's the right time. Even if you handle that spouse objection perfectly, you're not going to close them, right? because the uncertainty is like the main thing you need to do. If they're not certain that this is the right thing, now's the right time, they're never going to buy. Even if you handle a spouse objection perfectly, even if you handle the financial objection perfectly. So no matter what, the always first thing we do, and I created this diagram, so there's the investment drop. First thing we do is we paste the first objection, we tie down on the certainty that this is the right thing, now's the right time. So like the, my mental sort of way I think about it 
is what I always want to do first is see like before I handle your spouse objection, before I handle your financial objection, before I give you the next steps, are you 100% certain that you believe this is the right thing, now's the right time? I want to make sure there's no uncertainty objections. Because if I have somebody head over heels believing that my method and my product is the right way to getting to desire, if I have them there, then getting through the spouse and financial objections is not objection handling, it's just collaboration. We're just going through logistics together. You see what I mean? It's very key. So you'll see in all of my scripting frameworks, that's exactly how I do it. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. So another key point is we want to pace pace lead opposed to rebuttal. So a rebuttal, like the, the classic rebuttal, is, uh, oh, I can't afford to do it. You can't afford not to do it, you know? Uh, I want to think about it. What are you going to think about? Like, no, don't do that. You know, that's just bad, all right? So that's a rebuttal. What is a rebuttal? I mean, just imagine, right? You use your common sense. Do you feel like when you get a rebuttal, do you feel good as the prospect? Do you feel heard? Do you feel listened to? Do you feel like the pressure in the conversation increases or do you feel like it decreases? You know? Whereas pacing the first objection diffuses the pressure. And the other thing is too is a lot of people when they give you some resistance, they're kind of seeing like, okay, like let me see, like they're, they're kind of pressing up against you and they're gonna see what comes out. And they're gonna see, okay, is this like, is this person going to get frustrated with me or are they gonna understand? And so it's very, very key. You're gonna gain a lot of trust if you pace the first objection and pace based lead and diffuse the pressure opposed to um, giving a rebuttal. Rebuttals don't work, okay? Another key point, do you know what they really mean? All right? So oftentimes, you know, their first objection or the first thing they say doesn't make any sense, you know? And, and you don't know, you don't even know what they said. All right? Even if it logically sounds like they're saying something logical, like you don't really know what they mean by saying it. It doesn't mean they're wrong or they're, they're dumb or anything. It just, like, the communication is unclear. So the first step is always making sure, and this goes with your discovery. This is just almost an overarching sales principle, right? This goes with your discovery. This goes with your objection handle, but especially like the first thing they say after the investment drop, you gotta make sure you understand very clearly what that communication means, okay? So let's just say they say, like I, I just wrote an example here. Let's say you drop the investment and they say, I like this a lot. Uh, I just really need to gather myself on this one. What does that mean? You know, does that mean you need to gather, gather your finances? Does that mean you, you're not sure this is gonna work for you? Does that mean you need to gather your you know, business partners? Like what, what does that mean? So you would say, cool, you know, so no problem. Um, now when you say you wanted to gather yourself, if, um, if I can ask, like what do you mean by that? Or how do you mean exactly? You know, very, very simple, right? But like we need to do that always first before we even do any of the scripting. Does that make sense? And, and you know, if you ask somebody a question on a sales call and you get something that's not clear, you need to clarify it, okay? Naturally, if you just have the intention of I really wanna understand exactly what they mean by everything they say, you will just do this naturally. That's when you, when you can have the right intention and you can think about it the right way, those things, these things just happen naturally in good conversation, all right? But when you're in your head and you're trying to do the right thing and say the right thing, sometimes you just let these things slip through the cracks. Cool? You'd be really surprised how often that happens. I mean, this happens all of the time. I do this with everybody too. Like when my team speaks with me, I'm like, what does that mean? Tonality. So you also want to have your energy very grounded, centered. I always think of it and visualize it like the oak tree and your roots are going deep into the ground, okay? When they give you an objection, it doesn't throw you off and make you emotional or trigger you. You're just anchored in the present moment. That's very, very key, okay? That also diffuses pressure and builds trust. Again, you wanna utilize what they told you at the beginning of the call. We had a good conversation about this earlier. And um, this is why, what's really key, like I get so angry when I, even my team, if they don't take handwritten notes, okay? Or you know, at least take notes electronically on a Google Doc. Because your word's garbage, but the prospect word is gold. And they're gonna give you this gold all throughout the conversation. But guess what? In, in, you, know, you might remember like the best one or two things, but you're not gonna remember all of the things unless you write it down. So it's very, very, very key. 
And I think the big objection to this is people say, well, you know, I'm on Zoom, and if I write it down, they're not gonna think I'm listening. It's like, what, because you're like not looking at the monitor? I mean, like I, I know if I have, okay, so for instance, I had a conversation with uh, the head guy of Patrick Bet David's team last week, and I just like, you know, um, I was just like going, you know, I was like fire hosing information. And this dude was just taking notes the entire time. Like, does that demonstrate that he's listening or not listening? Obviously, it demonstrates that he's listening. And it's, it's very easy. Like, I, I will say, especially if you have six call, sales calls in a day, you know, we've all had this experience where your eyes start to gloss over. Especially when you're like, man, I've heard this same exact thing like 10 times. You know? Because, like, you'll, you'll start to see and pick up these patterns of, like, it's the same thing every time. You know, you're almost like, oh, I can like, and, and you know, it's funny in Neil Rackman's book, Spin Selling, they did that study and they noticed nine months after salespeople started that their performance dipped and they did this whole study analysis to find out why. And it's because after a certain amount of repetition of hearing the same damn thing, they just start to assume, okay, I've heard this a hundred times. I know exactly what your problem is. I'm just going to fix it. Right, I'm just going to, okay, diagnose and prescribe right now, opposed to even though you probably know what they're gonna say, still flushing everything out in discovery. That was the big breakthrough they had through that study. So you really need to write it down. Now, what I do, and this is, so there's those seven beliefs, right? I, I think about any objection that they could have, and I wanna write a phrase down to where at the end of the call, if they gave me that objection, I could say, no problem, just so I could understand Earlier you told me blank, right? His technique is he shows them what they said on the paper. He holds it up. Yeah, and he's like, well, earlier you told me this. I like that a lot, because you're showing, not telling. Earlier you told me this. Now you're saying this. So like, you know, let's just cut the BS and just be honest, like what's really going on? Okay, so you gotta think about like every objection. Oh, I wanna wait three months. I wanna wait till Christmas. I uh, don't think this is worth it. I don't think this is gonna work for me. Like, think of all the objections this person could have, everything that could go wrong, and then make sure you have the right data of their word, not your word, so that you could say this at the end. The thing is, is if you get the data before the objection, if you get that on the front end in your discovery, so that you're like, man, they could throw anything at me, I have their words to throw back at them to handle anything. If you do that, you'll never get objections. Right? By the nature of doing that activity and getting so prepared for the objection, you don't get the objection. Does anybody know, anybody know why that is? Okay, that's because of what's called the consistency bias. So an influence, right? You guys have read Influence by Robert Cialdini? Right, great book. It's worth, re that's like one of the books you reread a lot. If you guys know Alex Ramosi, that's like one of the books he reads like a couple times a year. I do too, it's like one of my favorite books. The first principle he talks about in influence is the consistency bias, right? It's our drive to want to appear consistent, okay? So when you get somebody stating things out loud in the beginning of the call, it's incongruent for them to not hold to that identity they set for themselves on the beginning of the call. I'm sure one of the things Chase is gonna talk to you guys about is labeling. You guys have heard of labeling, right? So, you know, um, I'll let him talk about it, but it's basically you're giving somebody an empowering identity on the front end, and then when you label their identity, identity is one of the highest drivers of human behavior, right? So they're more likely to be congruent with those actions. You know, if you're like, man, you're, like, I know you're such a hard worker, I know I won't have to get on top of you and like micromanage you at all, they're more likely to show up as a hard worker, you know, if you're, if you're coaching your team. So um, I already went over the last bullet, cool. So let's go over the exact scripting. This is where it's gonna get fun. Does this make sense so far to you guys? Is this valuable? Yeah. Okay. You guys are more engaged in our business crowd. It was so funny, like, uh, when we first had this event um, last year, you know, we're used to our business crowd that's like, you know, they're like hungover, they're like, they're like, uh, like you guys, you guys are like excited, they're like, eh. Whereas like you guys, like when we like, Started the event, everybody like got on their feet, like standing ovation, started screaming. It's good, man, it's refreshing. So let me see if I can zoom in. All right, so financial objection, all right? So this one, I will say, out of anything I teach, there's a lot I teach that I want you to look at the philosophy and the thinking behind what I'm saying, 
Not necessarily what I'm saying, you know, because it's not like there's these magic words you can spit out, then they're just like, oh, here's my credit card, and I buy it. I will say, though, this one you can use pretty verbatim. Like, this is, I've said this, God, probably a thousand times. I feel like I send a YouTube video that explains this uh, on my channel. I've sent this to, like, so many clients, so many times, sometimes multiple times per client. And, uh, yeah, man, this is like, this thing works, okay? So we're just going to go through it together. Have fun. So... Salesperson says, the investment's just 12K, then they shut up, right? You guys know silence after the uh, price drop, right? So the prospect says, that's too expensive, I don't have the money, I can't afford it, any, 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 of, any of that, right? So the salesperson says, no problem. Now, just so I can say a word as on my end, money aside, is there anything else that's keeping you from being less than 100% certain that this is really what you need to get your real estate business to 20K a month? Okay, so let's break this one down right here. Right here. So no problem. So I got this from Eli, but um, I've, always, I've always, always used this once I learned it. And so a good way to train yourself, any objection you get, is to just train yourself to start by saying no problem. Okay? Because you're not really agreeing with them, but you're just saying like no problem, and it just diffuses the pressure. So you say no problem, and then you imagine in your mind the oak tree. See, if you guys can take away anything from this, I mean, everybody can start doing that. That's like pretty easy. So that diffuses the pressure. It's much better than saying, well, what do you want to think about? You can't afford not to do it. Okay? Now. So now is a word that, you know, NLP brings them back to the present moment, also breaks their pattern. If you, if you guys listen to my sales letters, I'm constantly like, now, now, now. It's also just how I talk. Now. Just so I can stay organized on my end. Money aside, is there anything else that's keeping you from being less than 100% certain that basically this is the right thing, now is the right time? But I say uh, that this is what you need. The four things, like let's say your pitch is four things. You guys know my pitching framework. That the, this is the four things you need to get your real estate business at 20K a month. Money and everything aside. They say, no, I really want to do it. I just don't know how I can afford that amount. That's almost as much as a new car. Salesperson says, gotcha. So if I'm hearing you correctly, money aside, you're 100% in. Right? You don't say... Gotcha, so money aside, you're 100% in? You say, gotcha. So if I'm hearing you correctly, money aside, you're 100% in. Like, you gotta slow it down a little bit. Because what we want them to hear, we actually want them to say no. Because if they say no, then we can talk about the real objection. Like, the first thing I always wanna do is almost try to get them to say they're not bought in on the process so that I can handle them and get them bought in on the process. So that's why it's very, very key here because this first one, again, there's a lot of scripts people run, right? So like. You know, here a lot of times they'll just say, oh no, I want to do it, you know, and they don't really want to do it. But when you do this real powerful language, like, so like double tie down, and then you use 100% in, like 100% is a very key word there because it's like an absolute type of language. I'll do questions at the end. This is a long presentation. Um, just rejected. 100%. Uh, <laughs> Right? It's just absolute language. Like people don't want to get tied down into that. You know, I, I showed this to somebody one time, and then somebody was like, oh, like that's it's that's too strong. I was like, that's the whole point. Like I want them to actually say, well, like I don't, you know, I'm kind of, and, and then I can, you know, cover what's really going on. So what's also very key here is when you're doing this double tie down, you're not only looking for like, no, yes, right? Like I'm 100 percent in, or like, no, I think it's what's gonna work, etc. What you're also looking for is you're watching their tonality. And so if they say, if you say, is there anything else to keep you from being less than 100% certain that this is what you need to get to 20K a month? And they're like, well, I, I, uh, I think so. You know, like that's not like 100% certain. Okay? So I'll just call that out and be like, I think so. Like what, what's really going on? Like what's keeping you from being less than 100% certain that you feel like this is really what you need? And when you can do those little cutoffs there, like sometimes you need to cut people off in sales, especially in this. When you can mind read, and you can see what's going on with them emotionally be, uh, below their words, and you can call it out, automatically you have an honest conversation. Right? So Tony Robbins, this is what he does when he gets like people. I learned this when I, I watched this uh, audio. I don't even think I was supposed to have it. But it was Tony Robbins having this intervention with the Spurs team way back in the day. This is old school. And he's... Uh, He's walking through like how he had this intervention and like all the things that he did and all the things that he said. And basically, like none of these guys, like they thought he was just some motivational like BS speaker. 
You know, it's not like me getting in front of up you know, with you guys. Like you guys are all like engaged, want to learn. You know, he had like Dennis Rodman, like arms crossed, like hung over, like trying to sleep in the middle of when he was talking. You know, it was like all this stuff he had to deal with. And he goes through like some of the techniques he used to really open them up because essentially like they had this crazy breakthrough by the end of their day or two with Tony or whatever. And um, one of the things he talked about was constantly mind reading. And it's like, you, you don't just look, uh, listen to their words or hear their words or feel their words. You feel what's beneath that and then you call it out. Then you instantly can have an honest conversation every single time. So again, circling all the way back. Here, if, if, you, if you find that what they're saying isn't in aligning with their tonality, you gotta call it out. It triggers the instant conversation to always give you the real objection. That's why I wanna say 100% and I wanna use that absolute language. Does it make sense? Cool, so let's just say in this example that they, they, they pass the double tie down, they say yes twice, and, and you get that certainty-based tonality. Then you say, gotcha. Well, so look, most of my clients who do the investment up front, but for certain clients, depending on the situation, we allow them to break it up. So um, given your 100% in, it's just a way to make it work financially, is it, are you open to exploring the possibility of that? So uh, what I'm really doing is just getting permission here. And I kind of see, given you're 100% in. You know? So now what I'm doing visually, like this is how I visualize it if I'm on the call. I, I kind of like, we're, we're on opposite sides of the table. And then now we're on like the same side of the table. Or you know, really, you should be on the same side of the table all throughout the call. So I guess we're just like, you know, we're closer now, in a sense. We're, we're collaborating even more. And so they're like, okay, like they're always gonna say, okay, well, sure, like what does it look like? Well, it depends, you know, everything's all customized and it kind of depends on what you need. So are you open to having an honest conversation financially, getting everything out on the table, so we can see if there's a possibility of you doing this now, or at the very least, we can create a game plan for you to do this in the future. So what's it look like? Well, it depends kind of on your finances, right? So are you open to having an honest conversation financially, getting everything on the table so we can see if you could do this now or at the very least, you know, we can work towards something in the future. That's why I always drop in this thing here because that gives them the out that it's not gonna be a hard close. That I'm open to maybe we can't do it now, we gotta do it later, which is true. So here I'm getting double permission, all right? So you see I got double tie down, I got double permission here, okay? Sure, okay, great. So in the next 30 days, how much cash flow do you have coming in? They're like, oh, I got 5K a month coming in. Great, and then how much do you have left over after expenses? Oh, my expenses are 3,800. Okay, so you got 1,200 left over. Cool, and what's your cash on hand exactly right now? So this question here is designed to just kind of get them talking. Even though it is somewhat valuable data, everybody will give you this. Now the cash on hand is a little bit more uh, invasive, I guess you could say. It's a little bit more aggressive. So I kind of, I pace them by doing this one. Then I say, cool, and what's your cash on hand exactly right now? Is that checking or is that savings? Gotcha, and that's the exact number you have available. I'm not asking you what you could spend right now. I'm just asking what you actually have access to so we can make the best decision for you. Okay, so this is key, right? Now, every single time I teach this, somebody's like, you're gonna ask, you're gonna ask how much money's in their bank account? <laughs> yes, okay? Because again, this person just told me twice, they're 100% certain they want to do this. They also told me twice, yes, I'm open to having an honest conversation financially. If, and you got to think in your head, if somebody is visually, like, if they are in a place where they're like, man, I am like, I would do anything to do this, right? I like, I know I need this. If I had this, I could get to blank. If they're in that place, like, yeah, they'll just tell you how much money's in their bank account. They're like, how could we do it, man? Just because you know how much is in their bank account doesn't mean you're gonna like zap it out of there with your mind. And so anyways, you have to say this. If you, if you have issues saying this and you think it's wrong, they're gonna think it's weird. If you think it's weird, they're gonna think it's weird. If you just think this is a natural part of me collaborating with you, helping you to get to where you wanna go, they'll tell you, oh, I got 621, check in, okay? So this is very, very key. So I get the data, then I get their credit. So in terms of credit, what do you have the cards? How much is available? Blah, 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 blah. Then what I do is I do, I mean, I'm taking notes. I'm a good salesperson. And I just do some simple math. I'm like, okay, they got 10K cash on hand. They got 2K credit. They got 3K left over next month. Okay, great. And so then, then I, I mentally think in my brain, can they do the pay in full? Or if not, what's the highest payment plan they could do? Because sometimes 
They can actually do the pay in full. We just need to handle fear. Other times, it's like, okay, realistically, I get why they can't do the pay in full, but we could sneak in a toupee. So you want to kind of figure out, out of the payment plans you have to offer, because you haven't said any of them yet, right? We just said 12K. So you got to think, like, what is the highest one that we could do? Right? And you want to err on the side of the highest one, because let's say you're between two pay and three pay, you could always drop back down to a three pay. Does that make sense? You'll see how I do it. So then, I've realized here that I'm at a stage where I've kind of uh, got a lot of information. And so what I need to do is I need to pull away to get them to come closer to me. So I say, and you still really want to do this, right? Okay. Yeah, I really want to do it. So I need that little like step forward again. Because I just got like, you know, they kind of just got naked in front of me. So I need them to, to say again, I really want to do it. I'm on my funny, funny game today. <laughs> okay. So you still really want to do it, right? 100%. Because look, I don't think the best thing for you is to drop 12K right now if that's going to mean you're going to spend all your savings and go into credit card debt. But I also don't think the best thing for you given you just told me you haven't had a transaction in real estate in the past six months, the interest rates are making it even harder and you don't have a marketing strategy, because of all of that, I also don't think the best thing for you is to do nothing. So what I'd be willing to do for you is let you in for half. That way you can get your authority campaign built out, you can get your sales process dialed in, your lead flow follow-up process dialed in, to where in 30 days from now when that second payment comes down the road, you have tons of momentum, you know that this is the right investment, and that payment basically becomes an afterthought. So if I'm willing to do that for you, are you willing to move forward right now? All right, so let's break out what I said there. So I don't think the best thing is for you to X, I also don't think the best thing is to, I, I say that like every time, you'll see this, I, I do that all the time. That's like my tee up to close, my preeminent intro close. And then I, uh, I say, you know, because of that, what I'd be willing to do for you, like I'm doing something special for them, let's change for half down, then you can future pace, future pace, future pace, future pace. To where when the second payment comes around, like you're, you're basically a new person, you know? It's just an afterthought. So if I'm willing to do that for you, are you willing to move forward right now? So that's a trade. See how I did the trade? I'm trading better terms for a decision right now. Does that make sense? It's like, I don't know why you would ever give a payment plan without asking for something in return. You see what I mean, guys? All right? Now, the, the really great thing about where we're at right now, by the way, I'm going to go over on my presentation. I've been, I've been going too long. So anyways, um, the really great thing about where we're at now is I know how much money they have. So they can't tell me like, oh, you know, I, oh, I, don't, I can't afford it. Like, no, you just told me you could. So now the only reason that like what will actually happen here is if there was an uncertainty objection and you missed it, you'll get it here, right? Or a lot of times if there was one and you didn't handle it, they won't tell you their cash on hand. So then you know, okay, I, I, I missed something. So here, let's say they say, you know, you know they can do the toupee. And they're like, oh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a lot. I don't know if I could do it. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you correctly, it just, you, you feel like this is a big decision, yeah? Right, so you're sure so you're a little bit nervous. Cool, like, well, I totally understand. And to be honest, I'd be frightened alive if you weren't a little bit nervous. I think you were a freaking alien. Like, the nerves are good. That means there's some weight to it, there's some meaning to it. Nothing ever great in this world was built by somebody who wasn't a little bit nervous at first. But the real decision you have to make or are you going to let those nerves guide your decision making to contract? Or are you going to feel the fear and do it anyways? Are you going to feel those nerves and going to expand? And in doing so, open yourself up to a new possibility. Which one of those two people do you want to be? So what I did there, just right off the cuff, I kind of made that up, is when, I, when they start to get to the point in the sales call, objection handling process, where you really want to get them, especially if it's somebody who won't make a decision right now, but they like know they want to do it, is you want to give them the objection that you want to handle, and then you handle it. 
And the version of the objection you always give is that basically, you can't say, is the reason you're not moving forward fear? Because they're gonna be like, no, <laughs> no, mm -mm. <laughs> But you, it's basically what it is, it is fear, right? You can't say, are you nervous? They're gonna be like, no. <laughs> so what I say is I say, it's a big decision, isn't it? Yeah, that's, so like, especially if you're like, so like, okay, well, what's keeping you from being less than 100% certain? Like, they're like, uh, I don't know, I really wanna do it. Uh, it's just a big decision, isn't it? Yeah, I totally get that. It is a big decision, you know? And then you can handle basically that objection. Does that make sense? So when they don't know what the objection is, it's always gonna be the fear, which then you just give them the big decision and then you handle big decision. You gave them the objection you wanna handle and then you handle it. Because now you're coaching them on successfully making decisions correctly, not really coaching them on is your product gonna work or not. You're coaching them on how to make decisions. Does this make sense? Once, you, if you, once you're good, like I knew for me, if I could get the call to that point where it's no longer about the product or the method, it's just about the way you make decisions and, and, and going through fear and going through nerves. I mean, 99% close rate, especially when you master this stuff. Does it make sense? Cool, you give the objection, <laughs> you, you give them the objection you wanna handle, then you handle the objection you wanted to handle. So, then once I get this down, and, and let's, say like, let's say you handle the nerves and then they still were just waffling, then what you could do is you could say, well look, what if we do, and then you go down to a three pay, and then you say, if we do that, Will you not only move forward now, but and give me a case study when you get results? So then we up the ante on what we're getting in return. Now we got the decision now and a case study. Does it make sense? So we're, we're trading. Cool. So let's move on. We got support. Was that helpful for finances? So a lot of you guys have heard me. I mean, I've said that framework until I, I, you could wake me up at 3 in the morning in the middle of the night, and I could just like start going on that one. You know, I've, I've taught that so many times. But it's for a reason, I mean, it works so well. Like once I, I, I swear I would close 50% of my closes literally saying those exact words, always. So support. So the first thing you do here is, is again, we're gonna paste the first objection. Okay, that sounds great, I gotta talk to my spouse, no problem. So aside from letting your spouse know, is there anything else that's keeping you from being less than 100% certain that this is really what you wanna do? Cool, no, I really wanna do it. Awesome, so let's just pretend for a moment that You'd already talked with your spouse, and they said, honey, you know, whatever you think is the best for not only us, but for the business, I trust you. You can make whatever decision that you want. Imagine you'd already had that conversation and we're talking right now. Would we be 100% handling the investment together and then moving forward right now? Gotcha. So talking with her aside, you're 100% in. So I did a triple, triple tie down there. But you see the point. Like, I really wanna know, is there anything else? Or do you really just gotta talk to this person? Does it make sense? Okay, now if there is anything else, that's, that's uncertainty, we're gonna cover that last. So, then we're gonna move on to step two. Step two is the two spouse objections. So, they're like, no, 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 I really, really wanna do it, it's just the spouse, you know, just, uh, just gotta talk with them. Okay, cool. Awesome, well, I totally agree with you, no problem at all. Now, just for clarity's sake, is this like a respect thing to where like you're 100% gonna do this, you're just kind of letting them know beforehand out of respect? Or two, do you really you guys really have to you know, have a serious sit down conversation and you really gotta get permission and buy-in from them to be able to move forward? So what am I doing here? You guys remember from earlier? Courtesy versus permission, right? Now, unless they say, nah, nah, like, I'm 100% gonna do it, just really gotta let them know out of respect, like they kinda correct you here, almost every time it's a permission. Nobody wants to say, yeah, I need permission. You know, nobody wants to say that. So if you hear any hesitation, it's the permission, okay? So then we go to permission. So um, then what we gotta do is if we know, regardless of which one it is, then what we do is we start to do a little mini information gathering. Okay, well, what do you, and, and this is, I actually copy and pasted this from when I sold realtor, realtors. So it's all, uh, it was usually always like these old guys who had wives. So I said, uh, what do you think she'll think about this? Okay, what do you think, oh, she'll love it. What do you think when she's gonna hear the investment? Oh, she's gonna say it's a lot. 
okay, well, how do you plan to handle that? So I love to answer or ask these two first, because you'll, you'll get a totally different response to this one than you'll get to the one when, when they hear the investment. Is, are they supportive of you trying to fix blank? Are they supportive of you trying to get your real estate business back to one transaction a month? Do they know you're on this call? Okay, what would they think if they knew you were on this call? And then if it's just a, uh, if it's just a respect thing, cool, can you talk to them right now? Can you call them right now? If it's a permission thing, that you, you're not, usually not gonna fly. So after you do your mini discovery, as you're doing this mini discovery, you're kind of flushing out the truth of the situation, right? And what you really wanna do here is you wanna determine in your brain Am I gonna, cause it's like, there's you sort of handling the sales call and then there's you like sort of the puppeteer like mastering like where am I gonna take this thing from like a meta level. Have you guys ever felt that way? To where you're like so in the zone where it's like you're, you're, you're actually like saying the right things, like you're, you're talking to the person but then there's like a different version of you that's like, a, like meta and you're like directing things or am I just weird? Is that weird? <laughs> Maybe it's like some psycho ability or something. I don't know. I heard somebody else say it and I was like, man, I'm not psycho, that is a real thing. So anyways, your, your, your meta version of yourself needs to decide, is this a deposit close or am I gonna do a follow-up close? And I'm gonna go through both closes. Deposit close, perfect. So one last thing before we hop off, can I give you some advice of how I would handle this if I was you? Okay, cool, well look, I mean there's really two ways that you can go about it. Uh, it can be a conversation where you say, uh, hey babe, you know that business of mine where you know I spent a ton of money on, and uh, it's given us constant ups and downs and constant stress. Well, you know I uh, found this guy on the internet, <laughs> and he's gonna help us with it. It's it's seven k. Um, what do you think? So you could go about it that way, or you could go about it this way. Obviously, you don't think that that way is gonna work. So here's what I would do if I was you. Tonight you can sit sit down. I kind of stole this from Brian, by the way. Tonight you can sit it down and tell her confidently. Hey, babe, I know I let you down with this business, and despite that, I know that you supported me every single step of the way up until this point. And I want to let you know that I've decided and committed to growing this to where it should be, and I found somebody to help us get there. However, I didn't want to go around your back to make this decision because I really value your emotional support and buy-in on this journey as well. So in order to let you know that both I am serious, but that I also want your support, what I did is put down a 1K refundable deposit. That way, me and you both can hop on the initial onboarding together, call together and then determine if this is the right path for our family. And if it is, then we can move forward. If it's not, we can refund, no questions asked. So anyways, the onboarding call is Monday at 3 p.m. Can you make that time or do we have to reschedule? So then you kind of say, what well, after I'm doing you know, thousands of these calls, this is what works. So basically, then you deposit close, and then you get the, uh, you, you, you know, you get the onboarding call, they hop on, et cetera. Usually it's probably gonna be fine, they won't have to hop on. Is there anything I missed there, Brian? Because I, I gotta give Brian credit on that, I kind of stole it from him. No, that was perfect. Because remember, the spouse wants to be the supportive one, not the one that felt like they were betrayed. So if you push for a deposit, or you push for the close, the spouse is gonna feel like they got betrayed, and they'll rebel against being betrayed. If they feel like they get to be like the warrior that supports their partner, they're going to say yes 100% of the time. Yeah. So that's a good one. Um, follow up close. So this one's very similar. You say, okay, great. Appreciate you being honest with me about that. Can I give you a little bit of coaching on how I would talk to your spouse if I was you? Yes. Okay, well, there's two ways you can go about it. Then you say the number one thing is the same. You know, like, I found this guy on the internet. You know, it's like you kind of like make fun of it. Because like they get it. They're like, yeah, you know, like, because the issue with this stuff is that people will be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna to talk to my spouse, it's gonna work, and then they don't really think like, man, like I just booked a call from an ad and just met this person. Like, they, they don't really see in that moment all the holes their spouse is gonna uh, poke into it. And they don't go prepared into the conversation and then they get steamrolled. So you kinda of need to like call that out here. Or it can be a conversation where, and then again, you know, you just basically say the same thing and then you say, now, let me ask you, which one of those two guys is, do you think is going to convince their spouse? Or which one of those two people is going to convince their spouse? You're right. Because if you're not certain about this, then they're not going to be either, nor should they be. Because in scenario one, you're weak and you're, uh, and you're uncertain. 
and your direction as a leader and a partner. So the real question is, when you go to talk to your spouse, which one of those two people are you going to be? <coughs> Excuse me. So anyways, uh, you guys kind of get the point. We already did this. You booked the follow-up. One quick thing when you're booking follow-ups with spouses is it should be like tomorrow or the next day, right? It should never be like, so when do you think you can talk to your spouse? They're like, ah, oh, you know, probably like next week. Uh, January, after the holiday. It's like, aren't you gonna see, like, see them tonight? Like, you just told me this is the most important thing you wanted to fix. And now you're saying, like, you're not even gonna discuss the most important thing that you wanna fix. It's affecting all these other areas of your life. You're, you know, you're gonna table that conversation till after, you know, Christmas dinner. You know, so, anyways. You're probably not going to handle it exactly like that. If you're me, you might, but you know, I, I kind of make it funny. Um, but again, like it should be, I'm going to talk to them tonight, or oh, you know, we have this weird thing tonight. I'm going to talk to them tomorrow. Okay, fine. So last thing, <coughs> I got like a hair in my throat. Uncertainty-based objections. So this is, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of things you can say when you do that double tie down in the very beginning, but then you get like an actual objection instead of like it going down to finances or down the spouse, okay? So let's go through an example. The investment's just 12K. Hmm, I like it, I'm gonna think about this. No problem, so just, like, just so I can stay awareness on my end, what's keeping you from being less than 100% certain that this is really what you need to get your real estate business to 20K a month? No, 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 I, I really like it, I just wanna think about it. So you wanna sleep on it for a day? Yeah, I, I think so. Got it, so when we talk tomorrow, if you wake up feeling the same exact way you feel right now, then we're 100% doing the investment and moving forward. Um, well, I need to think about this. Okay, then you cut them off. So real fast, I'll pause. You see what I did here? As I said, when we talk tomorrow. So when they said they wanted to sleep on it, I presupposed that we're already gonna have the follow-up call tomorrow. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a little ninja tactic there. So. I'm like future pacing this conversation we're gonna have tomorrow, and then I wanna see what their level of certainty is in their tonality. Because a lot of times they won't say no, they'll just say, yeah, it's like, okay, well you don't seem certain. So then you cut them off, right? We, we mind read, we have that conversation. Okay, so we're definitely not 100% certain. And I, got, I just kinda make it funny, because like I really see them as who they are, and I'm like, okay, like let's just be honest, like I, I can see who you are right now, like I can see how you're feeling, Let's just be honest. So let's just be honest, scale of one to 10, one being like, I hate this guy, I wanna get out the phone, 10 being like, no, this is exactly what I need. Where do you feel like you fall at exactly? Oh, I'm at a seven, okay, got it. What do you feel like is keeping you from being a nine or a 10? Now you have the objection isolated, okay? Now, if they can come up with a reason, what are you guys gonna do? Yeah, this is the big decision, isn't it? Right, because we know how to handle that one. Like, that's our bread and butter. Yeah, exactly. I don't know, I'm just a seven. Yeah. Okay, so is there anything specifically that's keeping you from being a nine or a 10? I don't know, the investment's just a lot, but what about the process? Are you 100% certain the process, the four things we covered is what you need? Okay, so another example. Okay, the investment's just 12K. Hey, is this the best number to get back to? No problem, I'll make sure we have the contact information in a sec when we get off the phone um, so we can follow up. Now, just so I can say organized on my end, finances and everything aside, is there anything else keeping you from being less than 100% certain that this is really what you need right now? And then they say the pause, and they say, I, I think so, right? So you do the same thing. You cut them off. Okay, well, you don't sound 100% certain, like what's really going on. And it's a, it's a playful cutoff. You're not like combative with them. That's very key, or this is not gonna work. Playfulness is like, you know, like Grant Cardone, I used to think his sales training was really bad, and I still don't think it's that good technically. But what I do think is that, <laughs> what I do think is that he's real like funny and playful at the close. You know, and I think he gets away with a lot of like pressure because he's like fun, you know? So yeah, I do a little bit of that. My inner grant, my inner grant comes out. Um, another example. So the investment is just 12K. Sounds good. I got to see if I can afford it. Is, uh, is this the same one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I got to see if I can afford it. Is this the best number to get back to you? No problem. I'll make sure we have all the contact information before we get off the call. Now, just so I can stay where I was on my end, finance everything aside, anything else, right? So same thing. No, no, I really like it. Got it, so money aside, you're 100% in. Well, I wouldn't say 100%. What do you mean exactly, okay? So you see how like, this is, t this is a lot of times what's gonna happen when you use this language. Now, let's say you isolate an objection and you get a real tangible thing you wanna handle, 
Okay, what if this doesn't work? Has anybody had what if it doesn't work before? What if this doesn't work for me? So, cool, I hear you, I appreciate, the, you, I, I appreciate that, and I also acknowledge you for being honest with me about that. So, just so I can say we're gonna have the Maya in here, and again, like you can see, I've used this so many times, like say, just so I can understand, or you know, don't say organized every single time. But just so I can say we're gonna have the Maya here, you're saying that you know, we have 300 case studies, we've done this ourselves, so despite having 300 case studies and doing this ourselves, you feel like you're gonna be the only person that it doesn't work for. So they're like, haha, no, you know. Okay, great, can I ask you an honest question? If you come in and you do this, are you 100% gonna put in the work? They're like, yes. Okay, and then two, when you come in and you run into a problem, because there's no guarantees in life, except for when you go after what you want, and you get out of your comfort zone, there's gonna be problems. I can guarantee you that. So when you run into a snag, when you run into a problem, are you going to bury your head in the sand or are you gonna get vulnerable and raise your hand for help? No, I'm gonna get vulnerable and raise my hand for help. So, look, if we have a 90% success rate and you're gonna put in the work and you're gonna raise your hand when you need help, then why wouldn't this work for you, okay? So that's a classic one. That one's a little salesy, but it does work. So I need to sleep on it. So again, we're gonna paste the first objection. Okay, so gotcha. So if I understand you correctly, Right now, you feel like this is 100% what you need to blank. You just want to sleep on it to make sure you don't jump the gun. Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect. So when we talk tomorrow, if you feel the same exact way you feel right now in this moment right now, then we're 100% doing the investment and you're moving forward tomorrow. Okay? So then there's two options here. If they say yes, we can just schedule a follow-up for tomorrow. No problem. Or what we can do is we can do a, um, a refund close. Okay? So if you have somebody who you feel like is gonna be receptive towards getting challenged, I would go with the refund close, okay? If you feel like somebody is like a little bit more flowy, like you know, they really gotta feel the right way, I probably wouldn't do this, okay? So look, can I be honest with you for a second? I don't think the best thing for you is to jump the gun if you're not totally in alignment right now. I also don't think the best thing for you is given that your real estate business hasn't had a transaction in six months, and you're almost like 50% down of where you were last year, I also don't think the best thing for you is to come on this call and know you need to make a commitment and not make it. So I'm not gonna ask you for a decision today. I'm only gonna ask you for a commitment and for you to draw the line in the sand metaphorically and step across it and say that the last six months won't be like the next six months. And so put down half down now, we'll take care of the rest tomorrow when we talk, and then if tomorrow you wake up and in the bottom of your bones, you feel like, man, this is like the worst decision, I'm totally out of alignment, no problem, we'll just refund you, but at least that way, you've made the commitment to the universe right now. You know, universe, by the way, like, you, know, you gotta, it's like, is this an airy-fairy person, use that word. If not, you gotta use something else, okay? Due diligence, can I talk to one of your clients? So. I used to have all sorts of stuff here that I used to use, but I will say, the best thing to do is just have some clients they can talk to. Man, that usually solves the problem. So again, you paste the first objection. A lot of times with this one, if you just paste the first objection, you can basically get around it. You can like isolate out of it, all right? And then, and then you, they don't even have to circle back to this. But let's say they're really hung up on this. For whatever reason, like financial advisors, they, they really get hung up on this one if you guys serve that market. So gotcha, so aside from speaking to one of your clients and verifying we can actually fulfill uh, everything that we said we can do, is there anything else that's keeping you from knowing that this is what you need to blank? Okay, perfect. So once I connect you with one of our clients and they gave you the details on, the exp on, on their experience, if that aligns with what I told you on this call, what do you think the next step's gonna be from there? Okay, if they don't say anything but I'm 100% moving forward, then it's a smoke screen. Does it make sense? Cool? Cool, so awesome. In situations like these where somebody's 100%, they just wanna verify with the client, what we do is we connect you over Messenger with that client. You can ask them any questions that you want. All I ask is that you keep it over Messenger just to respect their time. Like they're a financial advisor making 20K a month. They are really busy. I don't want them fielding inbound calls from our clients all the time. That's why we have a team. But if you're just gonna ask a few questions, you just wanna verify that, hey, this is a real person and just get their feedback on your situation, you can ask a few questions on Messenger. Is that cool? Okay, great. I'm gonna make that connection now. Do you see it in Facebook? Okay, let me know when you see it. Now, what specific questions do you have? I'm just curious. Okay, great. Can you type those out as soon as we get off this call? That way, 
they have time to answer before we follow up in 48 hours. Cool? So I don't have time to implement. The, I'm gonna rush through this one because we're, you know, we're getting to the point where now where I feel bad. Um, <laughs> basically here, the, the, the issue with the I don't have time to implement is the thinking, okay? So again, they just got done telling you two key things. Number one, the XYZ problem was the number one problem and number one priority they have in their business or their lives. Number two, they also just told you that your method is what they need to achieve desire. So if they believe that this is the top priority of what they should be focusing on and that your method is the best way to get there, what else should they, like, what else is a priority over this? Does that make sense? So like, I don't have time is kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. It's like, well, you don't have time to do the very thing that's keeping me, keeping you from like not having time in the first place. So that's how you, you really want to transfer that thinking to somebody else. How you do it, you first paste the first objection, you isolate it, then you say, hey, can I be honest with you for a second? Are you sure? It might not be what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. Um, we're going to skip the guarantee one. Too big of a risk, okay? You, you know, this one's also, when I do that big decision thing, you can also use this, right? So it's like, I hear you on that. So right now, you just feel like this is like a big decision. It's like something that's kind of risky. Cool, well, like your goal for your real estate business is to make 50K a month, right? Ultimately, 600K per year, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. That is 0.01% of top income earners in the world, 600K a year. Now, do you think everybody wants to make that or that just 0.01% of the world wants to make it? Well, obviously, everybody wants to make that, but have you ever asked yourself, why do so few people actually do? It's because there is a divider. There's a glass wall. And that glass wall is risk. On one side is your uncomfort zone, discomfort. And on the other side is your comfort zone. 99% of people, they say they want those things, but when they bump up against that glass wall, instead of breaking through it, feeling the fear and doing it anyways, and actually expanding and getting outside of their comfort zone, which is the only place growth can happen, they do what? They contract and they, they go back to comfort because even though it's not getting them what they want, it's the only thing that they know. So the real question is not the risk, the real question is right now, who do you wanna be? Do you wanna be the top 1% that can break through that wall and do it anyways, or the 99% that's going to attract? So you see what I'm doing there? So again, like, is this like some like language, I, I, didn't, I, like, I just made this up one day, because this came from the proper way of thinking. Like I just made this up because this is actually how I think. And I'm just transferring that thinking to somebody else as a successful way of making decisions. And then we also covered the big decision one, right? Is it just a big decision? Yeah, it's just a big, exactly. Cool, and then you handle it like the nerves. I already taught, taught you guys that one. So I'm gonna wrap it up so Chase can go. But thank you guys very much. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this video. So obviously longer one, lots of information, one that you're going to have to save and come back to throughout the year. But I just wanted to say, I appreciate you guys hanging out. 2023 is going to be an amazing year for the remote closing Academy for the remote sales world in general. Hopefully you decide to stick on for the ride because it's going to be amazing. And we'd love to have you here and help out wherever you can. So with that being said, happy new year, Aaron here for the remote closing Academy. We'll see you guys on the next one. Talk soon. Peace.